To most people, the idea of a conservative counterculture seems like an oxymoron. Uh, the counterculture in the popular imagination is something that emerged in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and it was thoroughly saturated by left-wing images, aesthetics, political ideas, artistic creations. And so uh, at the time, it, it really was, because uh, if you take the kind of dominant narrative of the time, America was a, a, a kind of conformist society. The organizational man was in charge in the 1950s. You had three uh, television stations. You had uh, three automobile companies. You had uh, mass affluence, but it was something that was suffocating to many people who were more creative or more experimental. And so you had oh, this series of cultural movements. You had the Beats, you had the Hippies, you had the Black Panthers, you had the Weather Underground. You had this uh, kind of upsurge of creative activity, artistic activity, and political activity activity that all fell under the umbrella of the counterculture. But fast forward 60 years, the ideas of that time that were once countercultural are now mainstream. The critique that the counterculture of the left once carried is now the status quo. You see this everywhere. It's been the theme of a lot of my reporting in universities, in schools, in corporations, in government agencies, where in some cases you have the same people who were kind of left-wing Marxist, Leninist revolutionaries of the 1970s, now teaching federal government employees uh, DEI seminars. You've seen this long march to the institutions, which we've talked a lot about on this show, now come to a point of completion. And so in one sense, this is cause for despair. The conservative defense of the institution has failed, but it's also the cause of an opening and an opportunity and perhaps even some optimism. The conservative culture, which unfortunately many people in the more establishment, conservative spaces act as if they are still the establishment of the country. They act as if kind of country club republicanism is still at the height of power and prestige and, and privilege. Uh, to take a term from the left that uh, in some cases is accurately used, but that's not true at all. Uh, the positions, whether it's the in the universities or in the government agencies or in the, even in the C-suite of companies like Disney or Walmart or Target is a left-wing ideological space where you either have to genuinely believe in the left-wing uh, ideological positions, or you have to pretend to believe so and advance them e even with some sense of false consciousness or preference falsification. And so the conservatives have to take, take stock and say, well, in this situation, we have to actually create our own counterculture. Um, it has to be conservative in nature. It can't simply mimic the counterculture of the left. Uh, it can't simply take the tropes of that time and say we're going to appropriate them and enact them. Um, it actually has to say we're going to go actually deeper and try to understand why the conservative defense of the institutions failed. What were the actual genuine and legitimate and powerful critiques that were leveled uh, by the left in this 50-year span? Uh, and of course, uh, if we take it as a practical political matter, these critiques won. These critiques gained intellectual territory, they gained political territory, they gained institutional territory. We have to understand why. And then we actually have to go deeper and try to build up on these great principles, this great transmission of knowledge over uh, millennia, over centuries that conservatives believe in and try to breathe new life into them in a real way that is uh, uh, applicable, that is uh, uh, persuasive in modern times, that actually has purchase, that can actually create some sense of excitement, some sense of activism, some sense of uh, uh, emotional possibility in the here and now. We can't simply appeal to uh, ideas that have already been defeated. We have to resurrect a deeper principle that can then start to retake territory slowly, slowly, and steadily, and steadily. And I think something that I've observed over the last year, and I'm hoping to do a lot of reporting on in the coming year to give people a sense of possibility, is the emergence of something I'm calling the quiet right. There are many of us in the media that are really uh, members of the noisy right. 
uh, right? We're on social media, we're on Fox News, we're uh, 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 putting papers through think tanks, generating attention, generating controversy, generating heat, building counter narratives to the dominant discourse in our society, uh, and, and engaging in that battle that is very public, that is very loud, that, that generates a lot of attention, that generates a lot of conflict. That's, uh, whether we like it or not, the language of politics. But there's also another right counterculture that I think has uh, uh, stayed outside of the spotlight for the most part, but it's really where we have to invest a lot of our energy, a lot of our hope, a lot of our potential. The quiet right, in my view, is generating in three places. First and foremost, education. And so what I've uh, seen in my reporting, in my own personal life, is uh, thousands upon thousands of conservative families opting out of the public education system, opting out in some cases of elite private education system that is uh, e even more kind of DEI committed, even more left-wing ideology committed. They imagine themselves to be kind of mini Swarthmore's or mini Vassar's or mini Dartmouth colleges. Uh, these are those kind of NIAC named uh, affluent private schools. And they're seeking to create alternatives. And so I've noticed uh, in, in my own life, my own neighbors, my own colleagues, my own contacts, a huge uh, a, a, a movement towards homeschooling. We now have millions of families that have opted out of or organized a kind of official education, doing homeschooling in the house, in pods, through church groups, adopting new curricula, adopting a classical model of education, adopting a more rigorous religious ed education. I'm also seeing institutionally the, this network of classical K through 12 schools, some of which are affiliated with Catholic uh, religious institutions or Protestant re religious institutions, or even more secular liberal arts models. Uh, but they're saying, hey, wait a minute, let's go back to the tried and true principles of education. Uh, we're talking about logic, uh, uh, rhetoric, uh, grammar, mathematics, natural science, uh, religion, uh, uh, astronomy, music, etc. The seven classical liberal arts disciplines that emerged uh, in the Greeks, continued through the Romans, the Middle Ages, and then uh, really in all of our American elite universities throughout most of their history. Um, this uh, pedagogy, this system of classical education has been lost, but there are all of these schools, there are thousands of them now across the country, that are attracting a lot of energy and attention from parents that are saying, you know what, we're gonna go back to those timeless principles, the seven liberal arts, classical pedagogy, we're gonna revive them uh, and we're going to actually make them meaningful again. I think that is another hot spot, another bright spot, another optimistic place that doesn't get a lot of attention. And finally, we're seeing now this year, we've seen reporting on record enrollment in traditional religious colleges. These are places like Hillsdale College, uh, where I was a, a visiting teacher last year, an incredible place. Places like University of Dallas, Thomas Aquinas College, Benedictine College, and others that are seeing parents uh, uh, opting out of, in many cases, even prestigious Ivy League options for their kids and saying, you know what, what's more important than the status and prestige that I could get from an Ivy League institution and what's more important than the kind of uh, uh, kind of mass-produced uh, education my kid could get at a prestigious state institution? I'm going to invest my education dollars in one of these traditional liberal arts colleges, a place like Hillsdale, which offers something not just to establish prestige, not just to establish career readiness, not just to establish that credential of a BA uh, or a BS, but actually says, uh, uh, you know, we're going to shape the whole person. Uh, the purpose of education is not professional, but it's actually to cultivate uh, the soul, cultivate the human being, cultivate a higher understanding of, of, of eternal principles that we are uh, uh, transmitting from one generation to the next. Um, and, and I think all three of these things we're seeing are tremendous bright spots that have huge potential for investment in the future. The second area is arts and culture. Um, and I think this is really the, the second and, and, and important area we're seeing. Um, we're seeing, of course, uh, uh, right-wing pseudonymous accounts, uh, uh, some of whom you're probably familiar with, launching new magazines, new literary prizes, new publishing houses, new translation ventures for lost foreign works. Um, 
and a lot of people who are probably naturally fit for academia, and in some cases are actually uh, tenured academics who are pseudonymous. They don't want to uh, uh, make their politics known because of the peril of that, both reputationally and professionally. They're saying, you know, we're going to put our energy pseudonymously into these uh, literary and intellectual enterprises. It's almost a um, kind of parallel track to the organized academy um, that I think is, um, in, in some cases, maybe um, too edgy for my own tastes. Uh, but I, I appreciate that people are trying to push the envelope for uh, a kind of new right arts and culture. They're trying to say, you know, we want to actually be authentically transgressive of the dominant discourse, uh, not simply, you know, check the boxes of saying, you know, uh, free market economics, uh, whatever, the safe kind of uh, the, the, the safe uh, kind of civic libertarian right that is that has um, in some ways lost ground in academia, but is still a relatively safe position. People who are say I'm a classical liberal, um, but actually aren't uh, pushing those deeper challenges from the classical liberal tradition. And then the, the, the third area where I think we're seeing uh, tremendous progress is in media. If you look at the media ecosystem as a whole, conservatives have more uh, audience share, have more voice share today than we did in 2000, than we did in 2010. Um, on net, we have a much greater voice and a much larger plurality of voices than we did before. And obviously, we need to fight to push back against this censorship, against deplatforming, to ensure that we can still have a voice moving forward, that the algorithm and the hard coding don't uh, um, kind of turn the conservative media into an algorithmic ghetto on the internet. But we have to be optimistic. And I think what we've seen and what I've seen, and, and interesting me personally, is a lot of these independent voices, especially faith-based voices, saying, you know, we're gonna have a kind of traditional faith-based message that is packaged in a new way, that reaches young people, that reaches new parents, that reaches uh, people approaching middle age. Um, that's really exciting, that's really good. It's a, a kind of community that is an opt-out from mainstream media. You don't have to read the disinformation reporting at NBC News, you can actually turn to something that's much more substantive, long-form podcasting from a Christian or Catholic perspective, for example. Um, the second thing we're seeing is more industrial scale outfits. This is uh, places like the Daily Wire that are actually engaging in a very ambitious cultural and business enterprise to say, you know what, we're going to have more alternatives in the kind of at scale media distribution than just Fox News. We're going to have uh, the Daily Wire. We're going to have the Blaze. We're going to have other, other outfits that are saying we're going to come together as a business venture, make ourselves profitable by building an audience that is dedicated to what we're doing. And then we're going to push that line, push that message, push that narrative uh, in, in a way that can only be done through an organized activity uh, to, to provide a counterbalance to that corporate, kind of New York DC media, um, the legacy media, the, the ABCs, NBCs, CBS, CNN, et cetera. We're actually gonna challenge them, not just ideologically, but on, uh, on a, as a matter of business, as a matter of commerce, which of course plays right into the uh, longstanding conservative case for free markets. Well, we're gonna actually compete with the adversaries in the realm of free markets, not just the realm of abstract opinion. And third, what I think we're also seeing expressed in media, but also a deeper trend is that um, we're seeing, you know, kind of mom bloggers or, or, or kind of family bloggers revalorizing the idea of family. Uh, you're seeing very attractive uh, Instagram pages and Tumblr pages and social media feeds saying, you know what, uh, family is very important. We're going to provide a new aesthetic for family life, a new uh, vision for family life that isn't the kind of maybe older line, moral majority, focus on the family, kind of 1980s style, uh, evangelical vision, but actually something that is more broadly popular and broadly uh, uh, appealing to people who say, you know, uh, I don't want to have to buy into everything ideologically hook, line, and sinker on the right, um, but I want to feel like in, in contrast to queer theory, in contrast to gender ideology, uh, the, the nuclear family is good. Uh, moms, dads, kids uh, uh, coming together are the basis of society, should be celebrated, should be revalorized, um, should be really lifted up against the 
the left-wing ideological attack that we've seen uh, 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 really push the family into a defensive position. And then another thing I'm seeing, a kind of bright spot that is uh, fun for me to browse, although I'm certainly not uh, equipped or interested in doing personally, is a, a kind of conservative analog to the 1970s back to the land movement. You know, you had these hippies opting out of life in New York City and going up to Vermont uh, and, you know, growing uh, fruit and uh, playing the guitar. Uh, you, you've seen all of those images. You've seen those movies. Something that I grew up with, um, on, living kind of on the West Coast, this was kind of idealized. Um, and, and, and in many cases, was good. I think that they were really authentically... Uh, uh, authentically embracing these values of opting out of hyper-consumerism, opting out of the rat race, moving up to Vermont. And I think this is why someone who is, you know, I'm politically opposed to, like Bernie Sanders, uh, still I, I find somewhat an affable person. I find somewhat attractive as a personality uh, because he, he, he really represents that kind of old line commitment, you know, opting out and, and you know, moving to Vermont from New York. Uh, to try to pursue an authentic politics. Um, well, sorry, Bernie, but left-wing politics now is anything but authentic. Uh, the left-wing Back to the Land movement has been supplanted by the left-wing DEI bureaucracy movement. Uh, uh, and, and there's no place in left-wing politics right now for that kind of original authenticity. But not so for this right-wing or conservative analog. Um, I've seen a lot of people that I know saying, you know, we're moving to Idaho, we're moving to Montana, we bought a ranch, we're growing a farm. Um, they, they, they present this uh, kind of authentic conservative politics, something like a, a Wendell Berry style, rootedness. We're repopulating a small city, a small town. We're opening up a, a, a kind of cultural space uh, for conservatives uh, or attached to a religious institution or a, a new school. And I think these things are, are really good. It's a kind of rooted, um, uh, maybe even rural or small town conservatism. It's using the kind of iconic images of Americana and then uh, conveying them in a very attractive postmodern media narrative. Oh, I love browsing these things. I love watching these things. Um, I'm not going to be uh, ranching anytime soon, uh, but, uh, but I think that it's something that is overall a positive and exciting development. And then finally, the other big picture uh, trend that I'm tracking and looking at is the reshuffling or the big sort of Americans who are now moving and uh, seeking more habitable uh, political environs. So I think we've saw this over the last 10 years, and I think it's very much accelerated during the pandemic. Conservatives, and this is you know dozens of people that I know personally, and then I think the data also bears this out. Conservatives are fleeing from uh, kind of captured states like California and New York and Illinois, and then going to places like Texas and Florida and Idaho and Tennessee, where they feel like the state is not going to be punishing them. But in fact, they'll have a friendlier terrain for building a conservative community, transmitting conservative values to their kids, participating in conservative institutions, schools, local governments, civic institutions, and then actually building. And I felt this personally. You know, when I lived in Seattle, I tried to uh, uh, kind of kind of push against the dominant orthodoxy, but it's such an uphill battle. You get exhausted after a time, and you feel like you're at, at headwinds always, and it's very difficult to build and invest in alternative institutions that are gonna feel so much pressure right off the bat, just because of the demographic uh, uh, challenge, the demographic pressure, the dominant institutional arrangement that uh, puts uh, um, really a kind of hyper pressure on anything that would be that would be seen as a threat. But, you know, I've moved out to a small town. Many of my friends have moved uh, out of the Washington state into places like in Idaho where they say this is great. I can actually invest. I can actually participate. I can actually build. I can actually get involved on a, a board of directors for a new school project, for a classical K through 12 academy or or participate in a, a kind of conservative alternative at the university level or build up a very vibrant faith institution. And then, so we're starting to see this big sort, this big um, uh, fleeing uh, from left-wing policy towards the potential for a more uh, organic right-wing community building or conservative community building, uh, depending on who you ask. And I think this is very positive. It's very healthy. And ultimately, what does this all mean? We're seeing conservative intellectual activity, conservative artistic activity, conservative community building activity. Um, it provides the possibility for conservatives to live out their values 
uh, in a way that is uh, uh, protected, that a way that is cultivated, in a way that is um, rooted in relationships. And I think that this is really ultimately what we all want, what we all believe in. We believe that uh, those very uh, uh, flesh and blood institutions, the family, the neighborhood, the church, the school, the local government, are the places where our lives are made. And many of us, we live in the media world where we fight on abstractions, we fight on narratives, we fight on ideological grounds. And this is important, you have to do that in order to create protection for the more organic community building that exists below. But we shouldn't mistake one for the other. Um, ultimately, if you only fight at that narrative level, it's an empty life. I think that the real thing that we're all seeking, the real thing that I'm seeking and struggling to build in my own life is a sense of meaningful relationship and is a sense of cultivation for uh, uh, family, for those relationships, marriage, kids, uh, education, that K through 12 environment where you have a limited time, you have a very short time to transmit values and habits and beliefs and character traits to your kids. And you wanna do that in an environment where it's really uh, um, coming together to support that, that reflects your values. And then you also want to have the possibility of community relationships in local government and in civic institutions that also reinforces those things. And so I'm hoping that 2023 will be the year of the quiet right, the year that we take time out of our day to build those local institutions, the year that we all consider you know, maybe it's better if I move. Maybe it's better if I change schools for my kids. Maybe it's better if I spend a little more time getting involved in some institutions that really matter at the local level, regardless of what kind of status or prestige they might bring. Um, maybe it's good if we try to actually sacrifice some of those other uh, um, kind of aspirations or ambitions or material interests um, and dedicate them towards something that people aren't gonna hear about. Uh, except for those people who really matter, the small number of people who make up our day-to-day -day lives. And so uh, I'm going to hope to do better personally on this, this year. I'm going to hope to uh, highlight some of the builders and reformers and, and um, activists of the quiet right, to share some of the models, to share some of the case studies and successes. Because I think ultimately, you can have the great man theory of celebrity politics, in which the kind of great media personalities and political figures battle it out on our behalf in the realm of kind of uh, uh, high status pol political combat. Um, that's only gonna take us so far. We have to commit to this uh, and I'm hopefully uh, gonna contribute in my small way to making that happen.